So, dear participants, good afternoon, all. Very good afternoon, sir. We will uh, start today's session. I welcome you all to the today's program, especially our resource person. Sir has already joined earlier. And also, thank you all for uh, coming on time for today's session as well. So, please uh, make use of this opportunity. And please also remember, we have a slight change in the schedule as it will be communicated through the group. Tomorrow's program, we will not be having day after tomorrow. It is pre to tomorrow. We will exactly start at uh, 2.30. The program will begin on tomorrow, that is Thursday at 2.30. That is the third session also, because earlier we were announced it as on Friday, but there is pre -pwned. It will be conducted exactly at uh, 2.30. And, uh, and as you all know, you can, you, have, you can interact with the resource person during the talk, or you can also post your questions. A couple of the questions have already been forwarded to the Professor, I think he will uh, clarify those your questions during his talk. So with these few words, I welcome you all once again to the program, especially Professor Arnab Mukherjee, also to this talk. And uh, Mike is over to the coordinator, Dr. Jomon, if you have anything to say. Dr. Jomon. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, Professor Anand Mukherjee. Yeah, we have, as uh, Dr. Manaj has mentioned, that schedule change, kindly note that. And we have got a few questions, and that's forwarded. Um, I hope Professor Mukherjee will uh, talk on that. And uh, uh, almost 2,000 views can be seen in the live session, last, last day's live session. Uh, it is there on YouTube. And it is a clear one. Uh, uh, more than 2,000 views were there. So we could see that many, many cannot attend right now because uh, many are having exams, many are having classes this time, 2.30. And, but they are, they are watching a uh, recorded session. So anyway, students are making use of it. We are very glad to see that. Thank you. And OK, uh, we will start the session. and and. Over into Professor Anna Mukherjee. Okay, uh, so am I audible now? Yes, yes, you are audible. I'm sharing my slide. Okay, so the slide is visible, I guess, right? Yes. In fact, I'm using two accounts, one to uh, present and one to actually uh, see people. Because uh, in, in Google Meet, what happens is that yeah, I present, then I cannot see anybody. OK, so um, there are a few questions that I got by email. And most of the questions, actually, uh, I have not even covered the topic yet for those questions. Uh, and I'm going to, for example, the, the, some of the questions are, can we explain the concept of entropy and what exactly entropy means? So today, hopefully, you're going to learn that, what exactly entropy means. Any example of explaining zero law of thermodynamics? Yeah, yesterday I mentioned that, you know, zero law of thermodynamics, I have tried to explain in uh, by taking different examples. So... Uh, so basically, zero law of thermodynamics uh, is a postulate that says that if two bodies are in contact with each other and they attain thermal equilibrium, then it doesn't matter what kind of material uh, those systems are or those, uh, those ingredients are, as long as they're in thermal equilibrium, the temperature of that uh, two systems will be same. So based on the postulate that once in thermal equilibrium temperature is same, then you know one can devise uh, uh, properties like uh, expansion of solid or gas, uh, and um, those two I actually kind of explained. 
that one can use that those material property to define temperature so again i mentioned that hotness and coldness is kind of a feeling which cannot be quantified because that varies from person to person or 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 you know people to people or animals and things like that however a quantifiable thing like length of a rod or a volume of a gas that will have a fixed measurement and with that one can revise the temperature scale and uh, that's how i talked about yesterday that pv equal to nrt can be derived and r again is an experimental uh, parameter that uh, fits that equation the pv value at triple point uh, and pv value at uh, zero kelvin you know you can draw a straight line and uh, you can get any other point in between and one can devise a temperature scale based on that so uh, so zero law of thermodynamics defines temperature and because of which as we will see one can define first law second law and you know any other thing so that's why it has to be the first one okay so uh, that was uh, one question uh, i don't know if i have explained that because i did not understand the question that uh, uh, example for explaining so i i think i gave examples now can you explain different energy terms which i am going to talk today uh, like internal energy gives free energy and much free energy i will talk later uh, and how do you uh, determine surrounding of a system like uh, the, that's the last question for a bottle of water should i consider a room or entire universe as surrounding i think i very very clearly said yesterday putting the bottle in the picture of the universe that if bottle is a system then rest of the universe not the room but the rest of the universe is your surrounding because let's say you are do, you are burning a paper inside your room heat can go out of the of the room so that means you know room cannot be the environment so if you, if you if you are in an isolated room in which you are doing an experiment and burning a paper then you can say that rest of the room is the surrounding but you know you know assuming that the room is not fully isolated therefore you know heat will escape energy will escape and so basically system plus surrounding will contain the total energy and total material so system plus surrounding will have energy and material fixed and that's how uh, that's how uh, uh, that's what we believe about our present universe that in the present universe energy is conserved that means energy is not going out or coming in out of the universe because we don't even know if there is anything out of the universe or not although there are theories uh, that i'm not going to go in but even the material also we are not losing any material or or if even if you are losing it it gets converted to energy so energy plus material will be conserved so that is what uh, i think i explained and uh, another question was that uh, somebody has mentioned that he was trying to explain and uh, trying to understand thermodynamics uh, but you know kind of uh, not getting the picture because of the equations and all okay i want to stress one point the equations required in thermodynamics are of 12 standard only okay and i can guarantee you that if you have taken science and you have done calculus in 12 you already covered that mathematical part so why it becomes difficult why quantum mechanics and sometimes thermodynamics seem to be difficult because not because of equations or mathematics i have i have tried to explain that to students uh, here also it is not due to mathematics my mathematics knowledge is not great but 12 standard knowledge is more or less sufficient for this a little bit extra that's it but main problem comes when you look into the equations just by equation only and don't try to associate that to physical property for example if i tell you that dv dt at a constant pressure so you will think oh it's a partial differential equation del d del you know del t at a constant pressure and things look look complicated 
but if i tell you you are doing an experiment under you know atmospheric pressure or in a in the room where atmospheric pressure is there you are just trying to see that if you increase the temperature by heating a system how much volume is changing that experiment you do many times so you heat a system measure the temperature and measure the volume then is essentially you are calculating del v del t at a constant p and if you divide or normalize by the volume you will get expansion coefficient so all the thermodynamic quantities they have a meaning and majority of that or on rather all of that are there to help our experiment that you have to remember so some things we can do for example if i tell you del s del v at a constant p that means you calculate the change in entropy by changing the volume at a constant pressure that kind of experiment is not possible so people do people convert this to a measurable equation where you can do an experiment measure it and then you know what is del sl i think if i have time i will talk about it this is called uh, i think uh, partial differentials uh, on conversions of partial differentials and things like that but again if i cannot uh, cover it i urge you guys to please look into nbtel lectures it is explained in great detail with taking much more time because it is not possible to cover this subject in three lectures okay so here my objective is to just give you an overview so that you get an idea of what to expect now with that i will start i think there are only these four questions but please ask questions you know because i am sure that i myself had doubt that many many places and those are conceptual doubts thermodynamics is a simple subject but conceptually can it can be little heavy so now up to yesterday i covered zero law of thermodynamics okay and some of the uh, conceptual part of it today i will go into the first law of thermodynamics and you know the first law is the law of conservation of energy which means that i have to talk about energy and here just the question that came i am going to talk about different forms of energy so first thing that we are going to talk about is internal energy what is internal energy now i myself have a lot of confusion about this internal energy thing sometimes it is written as u sometimes it is written as e so the way i i can define that is that internal energy is basically the total energy of the system total energy can be of two types one is kinetic energy another is potential energy now all of you know what is kinetic energy kinetic energy comes from velocity half in v square is the kinetic energy that means if your mass is zero there is no kinetic energy and if your velocity is zero then, then also there is no kinetic energy so something at rest for example this object at rest has no kinetic energy on overall this object has no kinetic energy but the particle of this mouse is actually vibrating and it has a velocity and therefore that has a kinetic energy but the center of mass of this mouse right now is fixed and therefore this mouse itself does not have kinetic energy and what is potential energy that is more important you see that when when you define a system quantum mechanical you write down the hamiltonian of the system and that hamiltonian of the system has two terms again one is kinetic energy operator and another is potential energy operator that means in order to define a system you need both the potential energy and the kinetic energy okay so kinetic energy explain and in kinetic energy also one can have different types of kinetic energy for example translational rotational vibrational just now i talked about that right so for example if something some center of mass is moving then we call it translational but center of mass is not changing but let's say the different points of that object is actually you know moving in space so then it can be called as rotational and vibration is that when center of mass is not changing but particle is moving around with with the mean center of mass then it will be called vibration just like let's say uh, like a pendulum a pendulum you can say that you know it is moving back and forth back and forth uh, or or let's say if you if you talk about a particle moving across a uh, boundary those kind of things or or you can imagine the solid particles moving moving within uh, their lattice points vibrating 
So those are uh, different forms of kinetic energy that can have. So essentially what you have to calculate is the velocity and thereby you will know the kinetic energy of the system. Now potential energy is much, much more important. Why? Because that is, is useful in, in, in lot of things. So in potential energy also, when we first time, uh, I think we understand or study potential energy is around class seven standard. Uh, when they are, uh, you know, when you learn about gravitational potential energy. So if, if an object is at certain height, then uh, and of mass m, then the gravitational potential energy is mgh, as is mentioned here. So if something is on the ground, uh, on 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 a, on, a, on a particular surface, then the gravitational potential energy is zero. However, the potential energy of of an of a molecule, of an atom, and all that is not just gravitational potential energy because that is too small compared to the potential energy that molecule possesses and we call that as molecular potential energy. Now what, what is the origin of molecular potential energy? Again, according to quantum mechanics, the source of potential energy of the molecule is due to the electrostatics. That means like not due to the electrostatics, but the but basically uh, you can say that uh, we can write it down Write, it, write down the uh, potential energy operator in terms of uh, the nuclei and the electron and one can have either electron-electron repulsion or nuclear-electron attraction or nuclear-nuclear repulsion and that ultimately will result into uh, uh, result into our uh, observation of a some, of some material. So, so basically, let's say if I talk about, you, you know, about hydrogen atom, one can see that what is there in a hydrogen atom, you know, one proton, one electron, and one can solve that. But then when you go to hydrogen molecule, then, you know, things will become more complicated because you have two nuclear charges, two electrons, and their interactions will be there and things will become complicated. And of course, there is the overlap of orbitals and stuff like that. So, so the point is that at the end of the day, that molecule will have some energy associated in its construction. Okay, now how do I uh, explain that? For example, uh, I talk about uh, glucose. So it has its potential energy because if I you know, react with oxygen, then I will get carbon dioxide and water. So, and then some energy will be released. For example, ATP, you know, when ATP will break down, it will release energy. So where, where was the energy stored? It was stored in the molecule, which is now being extracted. When I have this particular paper, this has its potential energy. It, it is stored, you can call it as a chemical energy or something like that. If I burn it, then I will generate heat and light from this paper. So that means it was stored within that. Let's take an example of a coal. Now coal has potential energy in itself because again, if I burn the coal, then it will release the energy. So you can see, for example, hydrogen, hydrogen gas. So it will react with oxygen and it will, you know, release energy and it will convert to H2O. Even H2O will have uh, its own energy. So the thing is that every molecule I'm not going to energy that is stored in the atom, that I'll come later. But when atom forms a molecule, it gets stabilized and it can release energy. So energy is stored within that uh, molecule. Now what kind of interactions or what kind of energy that are associated with that, I'm trying to give some example here. For example, there are interactions uh, governed by ionic species. For example, sodium chloride, which has a very strong interaction energy of around 400 to 4,000 kilojoules. Then you have covalent bond, like for example, hydrogen, hydrogen, that will have around 150 to, you know, 1,000, you know, roughly. I'm talking about covalent bond, not just hydrogen, hydrogen, around covalent bond, because hydrogen, hydrogen around 430 or something, right? So similarly, you know, you have a metallic interactions and all that, right? These are strong interactions and there are also many weak interactions. For example, ion dipole interactions, sodium, interacting with water or hydrogen bond, which are fam familiar with that very much, right? Uh, for example, water, water hydrogen bond or many different types of hydrogen bond. So for example, if I take a paper and if I tear it, then actually I essentially broke hydrogen bond, not a chemical bond, because if I break chemical bond, it will require much more energy. 
But if I burn the paper, then I will break chemical bonds. So, which, so I had to do some work to overcome the energy that was stored within that and I released it, right? So similarly, there are dipole-dipole interactions, uh, in ion-induced dipole interactions and all sorts of things. All these interactions essentially is governed by quantum mechanical principles from the first one, where you write down the Hamiltonian in terms of um, uh, protons and electrons and then you can solve it. And after solving that, uh, that you will get the energy of the system. Remember, yesterday I told that quantum mechanics will give you energy of the system. However, thermodynamics will tell you whether the conversion or change in the material will be possible or not. So you can solve hydrogen atom quantum mechanically, you can solve hydrogen molecule quantum mechanically, but then thermodynamics will tell you whether those two hydrogen atoms will form a bond and make hydrogen molecule or not. Because that is governed by thermodynamic principle, whereas energy is obtained by solving quantum mechanics. So that is the difference. So now, what is energy then? Energy is again, kinetic energy plus potential energy. And potential energy means mostly we'll talk about molecular potential energy. For example, I talk about very simple argon gas. You know, they are noble gases. They don't have, you know, neither charges nor this thing, uh, nor they don't form covalent bond and all that. But still they have induced dipole, induced dipole interactions, which we call them as dispersive interaction. So when, so I'm just showing a energy plot and this, this x-axis is the distance. So when they are far apart, the energy, let's say, is zero because uh, it is not zero, but I'm just taking that as a reference frame. And when uh, they will come close together, then they, it will get stabilized. So it will get stabilized by this much. It will get stabilized by this much amount. So when they come closer, they get stabilized. That means when they will be apart, they will need energy. So you have to supply energy to make them apart. Or you can take out the energy to bring them close together. So this is our internal energy. However, here we are not considering the kinetic energy part. Only the potential energy itself we are considering here. But in a real system at normal temperature, you know, at 300 Kelvin temperature, I, yesterday I told you, right, that when you are taking a gas at 300 Kelvin temperature, it will the gas molecules will follow Maxwell-Boltzmann velocity distribution, which means that particle will move at certain speed and each particle will have its kinetic energy. And overall, the average velocity, whatever the average velocity will be there, then half in average velocity squared will be the kinetic energy of the entire system. And that will be equal to half kVt, which means the temperature itself is giving you the kinetic energy. But then where the potential energy is coming from, is coming from interaction between the molecules. So atoms and molecules, you know, starting from electron. Here we are not talking about the electron. Here we are only talking about, let's say, classical particles, uh, thinking them as, a, you know, a ball or something like that. Even then we can think classically that, uh, that every molecule, if it is not an ideal gas, then it will have some kind of interaction. So two hydrogen molecules will have interactions, two oxygen molecules will have interactions with each other. Even two hydrogen atoms will have equivalent uh, interactions, bonding uh, with each other and things like that, right? So together kinetic energy and potential energy is the internal energy of the system. Now some of you asked me about the free energy that is very different from internal energy because that will require our understanding of entropy and I have not covered that part yet so it has to wait. Once we understand entropy and once we understand internal energy, then you know by formula that what will be the free energy of the system. I'll come to that probably later. So, uh, yeah, so this is covered. Again, here I'm, I'm specifying that this means that we need to supply energy or heat to do the work and to break the system. So this will be an endothermic process because we know that an endothermic process will need to supply energy. Ideal gas has no interaction energy. Real gas has interaction energy. Liquid has more interaction. Solid has even more interactions. And that's why we see them as solid because their interaction is so strong that their kinetic energy cannot make them apart. And that's why those particles will adhere together and will think that you know, it will look like a solid part. Liquid particle, on the other hand, will you know, go away from, uh, from another particle, but it will not go so far apart that it will form gas. So gases will, you know, particles will go very far apart. 
So we call it no order situation. Liquid has local order and solid has long range order. Again, that is coming because of their interaction strength. If you make them more interacting, then it will form a more, uh, you know, uh, stronger uh, or more stable uh, state, right? So, okay, exothermic and endothermic, you know, so I'll just give that, okay? So, again, I'm giving some examples of reactions like ATP, producing heat, calcium carbonate, you know, it is that, uh, it's, you know, uh, I, we call it uh, line, right? So, I, I don't know whether you have seen it. And during the construction of houses, if you put water on that line, you will clearly see that heat is getting generated in that. Okay, so that's an exothermic process. And why it is happening? Because the, the, the reaction, this reaction, whether calcium carbonate will react with water to form, you know, COH2 or not, who, who decides that? Thermodynamics decides that. So thermodynamics will tell you whether this reaction will proceed from left to right or right to left. So that's why I told you that change is governed by thermodynamics. However, calculation of energy, you can calculate the energy of this left hand side using quantum mechanics, right hand side using quantum mechanics. But you want to know without a thermodynamics that whether the left hand side, uh, you know, will go to the right or right hand side will go to the left. So therefore, while matter is described by quantum mechanics, the change of matter is governed by thermodynamics. And rate of change of the matter, will again governed by chemical kinetics and that is given here. Again, you know that it will depend on the height of the barrier, whether the action will proceed from left to right, uh, um, left to right or right to left, that is thermodynamics, but how much time will take will depend on the kinetics. Now, one point uh, you should note is that this barrier can be as high as you may like. Thermodynamics do not care about that. All it cares about is the initial equilibrium state and the final equilibrium state. So as long as final equilibrium state is lower than the initial equilibrium state in terms of free energy, which I have not discussed yet, then reaction will proceed from left to right. So therefore, thermodynamics do not care about what happens in between. It only cares about one equilibrium state to another equilibrium state. So that's why we call them as state properties. It does not depend which direction, which way it goes. It all depends on what their values are in the initial and final points, right? So, uh, can you give an example of hydrogen bond breaking reaction that I talked about? Now, one more energy that I need to talk about and sometimes students wonder is the energy that comes out for the, from the conversion of matter using this you know, famous formula E equal to mc square. Because, you know, even a kid knows nowadays that, you know, uh, this the matter that came, uh, you know, from early universe is because of the, you know, energy that got converted to matter because so, so initially universe had only energy and no matter, right? So if the first atom to be formed was hydrogen and helium atom. So this is a nice periodic table that I got from, from this website, you know, from this site. And uh, you can see that this periodic table is colored according to how those elements were formed. So you can see hydrogen and helium were formed by big bang fusion. So in the big bang, when you know the first the temperature was like uh, 10 to the power 32 Kelvin, unimaginably high temperature, right? And then it cooled down, it produces first two elements, hydrogen and helium, and then, then slowly, slowly all other matters form. And you can see lithium requires dying of low mass stars. Beryllium will require cosmic ray fission. So, which means that, so if you see any of the elements and heavier elements, of course, requires exploding of massive stars. So, all the elements that we see around us, you know, my, my computer is made of all this, uh, you know, nice aluminium and some other stuff, silicon chips and all that. They were not formed by conversion of energy to mass on Earth. They require, for example, you know, silicon will require exploding of white dwarfs and massive stars. So they were formed in that early universe and that's what we are, we are using that now, those materials. So when you talk about thermodynamics, we don't talk about energy and mass conversion in, in, in these terms where uh, the amount of energy will convert it to mass because that's not going to happen on Earth. We, we do that. In nuclear explosions, you can see that how much energy is released. So those things are there, but that is not in, you know, used in usual you know, uh, heat energy uh, relation.
So heat energy relation, we are not going to talk about this mass to energy conversion. What we talk about that given the mass will be the same. However, energy conversion uh, will come from either work or the heat, not by fission or fusion of atoms. Now, I have a nice exercise for you. You can tell me the answer. So for example, right now my weight is 70 kg. So when I was born, it was, let's say, you know, few hundred grams, let's say, let's say one kg. So from one kg to 70 kg, I have gained uh, in, um, you know, in, in certain 40, 45 years and all. So typically, you know, an adult take 2000 calories per day to, to survive, to grow and all that, right? Two to 3000. Now, if you take all that energy for so many years, for example, 45 years multiplied by 365 days, multiplied by 2000 calories, and you convert that to mass, how much mass you're going to get? You know, normally I ask this question and expect an answer, but right now I don't know what you can do for yourself. And you will see that if, if you convert to mass, it will be like a microgram to nanogram. But my weight has increased by 69 kg, not a microgram. So which means that the energy that I take for the food, from the food, it is not what increasing my mass. It is not a mass to energy conversion that is happening. I am accumulating mass by putting mass in. When I eat rice, that rice mass in the rice gets converted to the mass that my body is constituted of. Energy is just to sustain the body temperature and other, uh, other uh, functions that uh, body does in order to uh, you know, carry out all the reactions, not to grow mass. So that's why this point I needed to clarify that E equal to mc squared doesn't apply in thermodynamics. Now, let's talk about work and heat. Because people used to think earlier, you know, heat is some caloric fluid and all, right? But what is work? Everybody knows, right? Force equal displacement along the direction of the force. So therefore, there is a dot product, if an oxida and all that. I'm just skipping that. So work is force into displacement. And if you write force as a, a force by area, then you have to multiply, uh, multiply the area in order to balance it. And force by area is pressure, so P into V. So whatever you used to know in 11 standard that work is forced into displacement, you can see that that is same as pressure into volume. There is no difference. If you calculate the unit, you will also see that the unit of PV is same as the unit of energy. And what is the unit of energy? Half mg squared. M is kg. V is, let's say, centimeter per second or meter per second. So kg meter square per second square is the unit of energy. And that is called joule. So PV also will have the unit of joule. Because that, so and right now we know that there is no difference between this work and the energy. And of course the heat and all that, but people did not know that earlier, right? Now, when you do work, this PV work, there is a convention that can be used. So convention is that when we talk about work, then it is work done on the system always. Now physicists actually use the opposite thing, or and chemical engineers probably. They always talk about work as if work done by the system. Now you know that work done on the system is negative of work done by the system. So therefore, whatever equation you see here will apply only if we are talking about work done on the system. But if you happen to see equations that describe work done by the system, then put a negative sign. Okay. And there are many different types of work that can talk about hydrostatic, surface uh, tension based work elongation when you pull a pull a string electrical work and all that right now first thing that we actually study is the pressure volume work so small amount of work dw is uh, given by minus p external dv that is very important p external we are not talking about any internal thing or not so it is like you have a gas and a piston uh, on that piston you have put some weight mg and that weight is the external pressure and that some you know the gas has to pull out in order to do the work just like i shown here for example there are three blocks here 
and there are gas molecules here and when i pull one block out then what will happen the external pressure reduces so you don't you don't try to calculate the difference between this three block and two block it is just two block at t equal to 0 there are three blocks but at t equal to 0 i took one block out there's there are only two blocks so p external is the pressure given by these two blocks only and there will be a corresponding expansion of the volume so now this state was p1 v1 because p is given by these three uh, blocks p2 is given by only these two blocks v is given by this much volume v2 is given by this much volume and we come from p1 v1 to p2 v2 in one step so this is a work done in one step so what will be the work done the work done will be minus p2 which is the external pressure into v2 minus v1 don't write rtl and v2 by v1 no because that only will happen if we go in a very very small way from the initial state to final state that is the reversible part. This is an irreversible part. We are doing in one step. So, again, I, I probably won't go into more elaborate detail of that, but you know, you can see Silvia Albertin's book. So, you can actually go in two steps and three steps and four steps. And finally, when you take an infinite step, remember, instead of three blocks, if you had only sands, very tiny, you know, very small grains of sands. And you are picking up one sand at a time and wait till the gas equilibrates. Then one more sand and till, wait till the gas equilibrates. We, when you do like that again and again, then the process that you are going to see is called quasi static process. So it is so slow, it is almost static. And the, by reversible, there is nothing, no process can be reversible. By reversible, what we mean essentially is a quasi static process. So if you go in a quasi-static manner, then you will see the work done that you get will be equal to uh, ln v2 by v1 minus rt ln v2 by v1, something like that, if I remember correctly. Now, coming back to V. So work we have discussed. Work is, again, a force into displacement or P into V. But what is heat? Now, heat, we, we know that in order to define heat, we need two quantities. One is specific heat and, and the change in the temperature. That is the heat that we supply. Earlier people used to think heat is nothing but uh, calorie fluid and something like that. And then by experiment, uh, especially Jules Paddleville experiment, which I'm going to talk about, that uh, it was shown that they have nothing but actually heat is nothing but work. Now, how do you show that? You, you have a paddle wheel here and there is a mass here attached to a pulley. Now the mass will, you know, will let go and will fall by some height h. Now, if the mass falls by height h, then it will lose a potential energy of mgh. Now, that means it should be converted to the kinetic energy of mgh into the paddle wheel. Now, thing is that, observation was that, that the, the kinetic energy of the paddle wheel was not mgh, was less than mgh. So, that means the rest of the kinetic energy, where did it go? It went into heating the liquid here because the temperature, the thermometer you can see, the temperature has increased from the earlier temperature. So it clearly shows that whatever the potential energy was there, that converted to the kinetic energy, you know, but not fully, the remaining kinetic energy got into heat and that increased the temperature. So there, that the Jules experiment uh, clearly demonstrated that, that that internal energy uh, is nothing but uh, nothing but uh, you know internal energy and heat they are interchangeable right and I have, I have discussed the same thing here so for energy we talk about joule and for heat we use calorie as a unit right so but there is a conversion which is for, you know 4.184 or 4.2 and one can convert joule to calorie nowadays we write calorie for everything, calorie for energy. Uh, we write joule uh, for energy also. Uh, we don't write joule for heat though. Uh, for uh, heat, we use normally calorie. But again, they, they are interchangeably used because they are nothing on this, but the same, right? So now, so what do we get? We get that change in the internal energy is nothing but heat. So now this is the fast part of the 
first law of thermodynamics. So, Joule's parallel experiment showed us that change in the internal energy. Remember, potential energy got changed. That is a change in the internal energy. That is equal to uh, heat, heat generated, right? So, that is when there is no work done because we did not do any work. But again, if you do some work, but in an adiabatic process where you don't let the heat go anywhere, one can show that change in the internal energy is nothing but work. For example, you are talking about an expansion, uh, expansion of a gas in an adiabatic chamber. So heat is not going to go out, but you are doing an expansion. So some work will be done. And you can see that the loss in internal energy is converted to the work that is done in this by on the system. So therefore, when no heat is being generated, then internal energy change is nothing but work. Now, if I combine these two things, they are independent things, but if I combine these two things, I can say that the change in the internal energy is equal to Q plus W. And this is what is the first law of thermodynamics. What it says, that change in the internal energy, that means whatever the energy of the system was, if I reduce it by some, something, then I can either convert to heat or can convert to work. Now, interesting thing is that when you do, when we generate heat, we don't get any work. So work is something that we want. We want to run a car. Heat will not do that. So we want engines to do that. Of course, with heat, we can do that, but we need an engine to convert it to work. So work is something that is useful. Heat just random heat is something which is not useful. They get wasted. They increase entropy of the universe. That will come to. So now when you write in differential form, so this delta is written for a big change. But when you write D, that is for a differential amount, a small amount, because a small amount is, 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 is more accurate, more measurable. And then one can change very, very small amount. And, and when you write that, it's, you know, you are talking about kind of a reversible processes, you know, like I explained, like a, a, a stepwise, um, what is that called, um, a quasi-static process. So du is equal to dq plus gw. So very easy to remember, no minus sign, nothing. Okay, now this first law is the law of conservation of energy. That means you can clearly see that if you, if you don't have any internal energy, du equal to zero suppose, then in order to get the work done, you need to do something. You need to, in order to get the work done on the system, you need to supply heat. Otherwise, it's not possible. So if there is no U, no heat, then you cannot get the work done. That's why we say that there is nothing called free lunch. So in order to get the work done, you need to supply energy. That is the most point. And that energy is there in the coal. When you, let's say, uh, cook a food, or when you run a steam engine, or when you, uh, uh, let's say, uh, you, know, uh, you know, think about like uh, running a car. You need petrol. The 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 energy stored in the in the potential energy of the of the of the petrol, right? So you, can, you cannot run a car in water, right? Uh, so 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 therefore, in order to get something, get a more useful work done, you need to supply energy, and that's what is the first law of thermodynamics it tells us. That's why a perpetual motion machine which runs in one direction that actually does some work. That is not possible if you don't supply any energy to it. That's why perpetual motion machine of the first kind is not possible because one has to supply energy. Okay, so now a little bit more mathematics, but notice that this is nothing but well, standard mathematics. So we are going to define state function and path function. What is state function? State function is that given the state of a system, if I specify in B and D, then you know, irrespective of however we got there, it is not going to change. For example, I tell you state function as a height of a hill. Okay, let's say we have very nice hills here in, uh, in, in and around Pune. You must be having in Kerala, you know, beautiful, beautiful hills. You go to one of the hill and mark the height of the hill. Okay, and that particular place you can reach by many different ways. You know, you, you know, maybe in a hundred different ways you can reach at the top of that hill. Will the height change? Never. Because that's a state function. That is the property of that particular place. 
the height is not going to change whichever way you go either round or direct or whatever because that's a state function similar and and the state function that height depends on what coordinates i would say that x y coordinate for example if i if i talk about or we can talk about a map map coordinate so you you need longitude and latitude so given a longitude and latitude you know the height so height is a function of two variables longitude and latitude similarly what i'm talking about here is that this thermodynamic variable that i'm going to talk about like internal energy internal energy is a state function so given some property like you know s v n n basically is not going to change it given fixed s fixed v fixed n u is always going to be fixed no matter how you got there so i'm giving an more mathematical example now z is a function of x and y z you can think of as a height and then i can write the change in z let's say change in h as a function of uh, partial differential these are called partial differential that means del z by del x at a fixed y dx del z by del y at a fixed x dy so this is the form now what i'm say saying in by this particular form i am saying that if you only change x and don't change y see that is the physical meaning of this right if you only change x and don't change y then there will be a change in z or if you only change y and don't change x there will be a change in z now overall change in z is a combination of that you can very clearly see in a map you go to the right then to the uh, go to uh, go up and then to right or go right first and then up you reach the same point so it does not matter which way you are going you can go multiple different pathways to the same point you can go you know directly from that to that in a diagonal manner or you can go up and then right right and then up or any zigzag manner whichever manner you go height of that particular point is never going to change so z so so but again uh, if z is a state function then now what is the property of a state function now now i write this del z by del x as m and del z by del y as n so i can write the same in the same equation and then what i say is that if del n by del y and del n by del x at a, you know at this constant are equal which again i am writing it in a second derivative manner you see first i am taking a derivative with respect to x at a fixed y and then i am taking a derivative with respect to y at a fixed x so interchanging right hand side is interchanged first y and then x if this is equal that means essentially it means that whether you change x first and then y or y first and then x if they are do not change then it's a state function that means whether you go up and then right or right and then up your height does not change then height is a state function but if you find that if you go right and then up is different from up and right then there is a problem that is not going to be a state function that will be a path function so this is mathematical definition of an exact differential uh which u is an exact differential however heat and work both are not and the reason is there why heat and work are not because heat can be so so i'm writing u, u now as a function of uh temperature and volume and i can show you that you can either change temperature or volume to change u and note that use a function of any two variables that define the system here i am taking for convenience v and d and then using that i can now write q as du minus dw now what is dw dw is minus p delta v so minus dw is plus p delta v so that is not a problem and then i can write dq which is du plus p w v du i am taking from this equation and p i am taking from here and thereby i am writing this i know that this is slightly faster but you will have the slide you can look it up later on and then you will see that it is pretty straightforward so now if i take v as a constant then i will get dq v what is dq v what is dq v dq v is change in the heat at a constant volume remember all the equations all the equations that i'm showing here they have physical meaning so maybe i don't have enough time to explain here but try to find the physical meaning yourself 
and you will see that it is actually not that difficult. So when I'm talking about heat, why heat is a path function? Because heat can be changed by either at a fixed volume or at a fixed pressure or nothing fixed. So therefore you are getting multiple ways to heat a system. So DQV is that where you fix the volume. If you fix the volume, this quantity goes to zero and therefore you only are remaining with this quantity. No, you have V is a constant, right? So right side quantity goes to zero. Sorry, because dV is zero, because V is fixed. So you only get del U by del dV, dT. Now what is del U by del dV? It is a change in energy for change in temperature at a constant volume. What that is called? Specific heat at a constant volume. So dQ is CV dT. So CV is this and therefore dQ is CV dT and we can get the overall change in energy by integrating the CV dT. Now see all that, in all that, it is just differential equations and integration. These are the two things are required and conceptual understanding of those equations are required, right? Now, once I integrate it, if CV is not dependent on temperature, then we can take it out of the integration. I can integrate it and I can get CV T2 minus T1 or CV dt. So you see, DUV is CV dt for all systems. That is where a lot of people have confusions. We think that DU equal to CV dt. No, that is only true for ideal gas. That is not true for all the gases. Why? I can explain to you what it says that du is cvdt for example no now it says that that if uh, temperature is fixed then internal energy is not going to change that is true if temperature is fixed internal energy is not going to change okay uh, th there is a question okay please go ahead somebody raised your hand if you want to ask questions, please go ahead. If not, I will continue. So, if temperature is constant, then there will be no change in internal energy that is true for only for ideal gas. Remember, you have a gas system and the particles are going apart from each other. I already showed you, if they go apart from the, each other, their energy will increase. So, it is not possible for a real system to not change the internal energy uh, when uh, temperature is fixed, okay, but if the volume is also fixed, then it is possible that with the uh, same temp change in the uh, temperature, there will be no change in the internal energy. So that is the another kind of question that uh, can, that can be asked in the interview. For example, in interview, if you say, okay, D equal to C V D T, then I'm going to ask that, is it true for all systems? then you might say, no, it is not true for real system. It is true for ideal systems only. Then I'm going to ask you why it is not true for the real system. Then you have to explain that the real systems will have interactions with each other, which will change with volume because the particles will go apart from each other and their interactions will change and therefore internal energy is, is going to change, even though the temperature is same. Because temperature is same only ensures that the kinetic energy is same. But it does not ensure that the potential energy is same. Now, potential energy is same. Uh, I ideal gas do not have any potential energy because it is zero. So, therefore, for ideal gas, it does not matter. But for real gas, which has both potential energy and kinetic energy, the potential energy is going to get affected if the volume changes, but the temperature remains same. So, you understand? So you see that? So, I am going to ask all these questions one after another to understand whether you know exactly what this equation signify. It is not just the formula, but how the formula came, how, what it signify, what this V, you know, in the subscript signify, and why we can write that for all systems, and why it is okay to write D equal, D equal to CVDT for ideal gas. All these questions will be uh, a part of a series of questions in the interview. Okay, and again, this, this is this integration is possible because it is temperature independent. You can see that because if it is temperature dependent, you cannot take CV out of the integration, and therefore you will not get this simple expression. 
and that is shown here cv is a function of temperature but in a narrow range one can take it to be a constant and in within that narrow narrow range one can talk about this but not in a very big range that is another thing uh, that one can ask so you you see so basically the point is that in interview what happens is that uh, one tries to understand the fundamentals or conceptual uh, depth uh, of a person in this particular topic and therefore the questions will be asked in and around the same topic that you have studied but probably did not ask yourself questions to clarify your doubts so i suggest in general that whenever you are asked or reading something don't just read it but ask questions to yourself why 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 it is true why, why this integration is possible so if you ask questions to yourself some questions answer you will get some you will not get and the questions for which you don't get the answer you ask your teacher or your friend or you know consult a book i think asking questions is the best way to clarify the doubts and asking questions to yourself nobody is going to come and ask before anybody comes and ask you those questions you ask yourself first that will be my suggestion now we talked about the definition of uh, uh, definition of heat and work from macroscopic point of view now let us understand from microscopic point of view and in order to understand microscopic point of view i will take example of particle in a box now uh, for particle in a box uh, let me see if i can quickly uh, quickly uh, go to fit uh, colorado T Colorado. I should share the system from the other one. That is also fine. It's it's a little slower. This I think it's slower, so I just not do that. Let me be here. So. Let me just quickly show one thing. Uh, I'll do one thing. I'll just stop sharing this one. and stop sharing and then i will share it here okay and you can see pet colorado and i will go to chemistry and in the chemistry i'm going to go to bound states this is for quantum mechanics molecules and bound states and is there in physics yeah i can see heat and thermo demos are also there in this but i want quantum let you see because i'm going to give a demonstration on particle in a box which you are all familiar with so but i'm not getting it quick enough let's go to physics okay atomic interaction Hmm. I should have kept it ready beforehand. It's there in my computer somewhere, but uh, I don't see any place to search. Okay, there is one uh, bound state. I know it is called bound state. Double well and covalent bonds. Yeah.
Yes, I think this is the one. Oh, it's taking too much time. Yeah, it's loading up finally. Okay, so I think you can see it, right? So now, so. Uh, so you have not shared your screen, I think so. Uh, no, I can see it uh, in my other screen. You have not shared. Can you not see the? Yeah, it's visible, sir. It is, yes, it, it is visible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is there. You can go to the Google Meet and you can see. So, uh, I should. I would go to. Uh, so this is an example of a two two state system, but I wanted to go to one state only. So, let me start. One big column, but I don't want that. Okay, I said two state, but that's why it's called bound state superposition. So you can do a lot of things here, but uh, the one that I wanted it is not here, yeah, unfortunately. Uh, I wanted only one box that is not here. But it used to be there in this particular one earlier. Now I am talking about, so this is the same one. They have changed quite a bit from last time, but they are always upgrading it, these Java simulations. And one can even download the jar files in order to show that. Yes, I got that, okay. So all of you are familiar with particle in a box, right? For particle in a box, the height typically is you know infinite. But here, of course, infinity is not possible, right? So it, you know, some some of the typical height is taken. Now imagine, imagine the height is infinite. Okay. Now, uh, now what I want to do is that I want to do a PV work. Okay. So what happens in PV work? The volume gets expanded. Now imagine what is going to happen if the volume expands. Here we are not having volume, right? We are only having a one dimensional box, which means that we only have length. But if it is a three dimensional box, then change of the length it will essentially do a change in volume. So let's do, uh, let's increase the volume uh, and see what happens. So when we increase the volume, what do we observe? You observe that the energy levels energy levels themselves are getting closer you see of course we know that right from equation in particle in a box we know that that when the length increases the levels will become closer to each other now this is the thing that i wanted you to remember when uh, i will talk about the next part um, when i will talk about the next part uh, of my argument uh, about uh, this thing, uh, work and do, right? So here yeah, I'm going to uh, share my screen back again, uh, the PowerPoint one. Okay, so, so you see, imagine that uh, this is a system where some particles are in the ground state and some particles are in the first excited state. So this is a system and what is the energy of the system? It is one because because three particles are on the zero energy state and only one particle is in the excited state. 
with energy one. Let's say this is the configuration. Now, what is heat? What what heat means? Heat means that when you give heat, this particle from the ground state will go to the excited state. Now you see when you add two units of heat, then one particle has gone to now the energy level two. Now if you add that, you will see two plus one total energy is three. But the levels themselves did, did not change. But when you do work, just now what you saw is that when you do work, then what happens? The energy level themselves are they come down or they go up. So here, what is happening is that this, this is the compression process because I showed you an expansion process. Reverse is the compression process. In the expansion levels come down, in the compression levels will go up. So what is happening that the particle distribution is not changing. Three particles were in the ground and one particle was in the excited state. It is the same case. Three particles in the down and one particle is in the excited state. But the energy of the excited state itself has gone up. So this is the microscopic picture of work and heat. Work meaning your energy levels itself changes. Heat meaning your distribution of the particles in different levels change. Okay, so that you can understand by having this uh, particular picture of particle in a box in your mind. Of course, the real thing is much more complicated. But again, simple things we take in order to make our conceptual understanding stronger. Okay. So now, now the, the, the real thing comes, second law of thermodynamics. And this is what is essentially, uh, I would say, the, the beauty of thermodynamics and most profound understanding can be obtained from this particular, uh, uh, particular law only. You know, I, I'm not even going to talk about third law. So first law, zeroth law I talked about and now second law. Now we'll spend quite some time on second law and discuss about uh, entropy and all that, right? Now, before I talk about thermodynamics, I wanted to tell you some quotations. And these quotations are very important that actually talk about how profound, how interesting this subject is. So classical thermodynamics is the only physical theory of universal contained, which I'm convinced that with the applicability of its basic concepts will never be overthrown. So, so that's what, that much powerful, you know that, you know, um, uh, Newton's equations of motions were overthrown by, you know, uh, in, in terms of quantum mechanics uh, or general relativity and things like that, right? But here, this is something that Einstein is saying that, uh, you know, possibly cannot be overthrown. Now, second point, the second law of thermodynamics has the same degree of truth as a statement that if you throw a tumbler full of water into the sea, you cannot get back the same tumbler full of water out again. Now, you might think that, okay, if I, if I, you know, put a tumbler full of water in the sea, why can't I get the water back? What he's telling is that the same water, which were there in the tumbler before, before you put it into the sea, that water you cannot get back. So, exa for example, let's say you color the water by your favorite color. Let's say you can identify them. That tumbler full, you put it in the sea. And then you try to fill your tumbler again. Will you get the same colored water back? If you cannot get back, then the truth in that particular statement is same as the truth that is there in the second law of thermal. You will understand if you understand this one, you will understand second law of thermal. Third question: heat, heat energy of uniform temperature is the ultimate fate of all energy. That's what, that is again, it's a very, 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 very interesting thing. If you understand this one, you will understand second law. The power of sunlight, coal, electrical power, water power, winds, tides, do all the work of the world. We know what we need. We need electrical power to run, you know, battery and then run our refrigerator and all that, electric car. We need coal, we need wind power, all that. We do a lot of work. We are running computers, internet, whatnot. But what he's saying is that in the end, all unite to hasten the many molecular dance. Even molecule also will not be there at that time. So ultimately, the fate of the universe is that it will be just like a cold heat bath without any matter. It started with no matter, with huge temperature, and it will go to a very cold zero temperature, very close to zero temperature. 
and uh, no matter. That will be the fate of the universe. Now, this is very interesting. It has been suggested that thermodynamic irreversibility, we know that there are certain processes which are irreversible. I'm going to show some of them. It's due to cosmological expansion. Now, this is a hypothesis, maybe, you know, you can think about that. So, why entropy increase is favorable? Entropy of the universe is increasing all the time, and that is favorable. We will show that. But why that is favorable? That question you can only associate with the fact that at every instant our universe is expanding and faster. Every instant is expanding in faster manner. So, or faster it doesn't matter, but expansion itself uh, means that possibly that may be related to this thermodynamic irreversibility. Again, that's a quotation. Now, George Potter, very nice video you can find out in YouTube. Only one video probably you will get from by BBC is the Nobel laureate. So what he's saying is that the sine qua non, which is which means absolutely necessary of scientific enlightenment. That means if you want to be enlightened as a scientist, this is required to know or understand. This is such a fundamental subject that without knowing this, you cannot be scientifically enlightened. That's what George Potter is saying. Okay, I hope the quotations were inspiring enough to delve deep into the subject. Now, again, I have talked about all those changes. They were they are related to second law of thermodynamics. So I'm just bringing them again back, but I have already talk, told you so many times, so I'm not going to go. Now, in all those changes, all the processes that I talked about, whether a gas expands, so when you drop an ink into a water, you see that the ink you know, disperses into the water. It does not coagulate back as an ink. We have seen that all the time. No, when you blow air into the balloon and you leave it, the air will automatically go out spontaneously. It doesn't go in to the balloon. You, if you burn an incense, that that incense, uh, this uh, the smoke will will go across the room. It will not come back to a particular corner. All that thing we see, and in all these processes, energy is conserved. Somebody will say it's because of kinetic energy it is moving. Yes, kinetic energy is there, but it would be there even when the particle will be near the incense. It doesn't need to go. It can vibrate there itself, but it goes. It goes to all the rooms and if the windows are open, even outside the windows. Why? We have seen that. We observe that all the time. Only thing is that we have to explain that now. Why that happens? Energy conservation does not explain that. Because it's reversible all the time. The equations of motions are reversible. In, 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 you know, in mechanics. So therefore one cannot talk about the arrow of time. That entropy is something which is the non-conserved quantity, which is not conserved, that always changes. Yes, the non-conserved quantity is called entropy. Second law of thermodynamics says that entropy of the system plus surrounding always increases for a process, always increases for a process. Actually, as we can say spontaneous process, but that's why I say surrounding. Because if you talk about both system and surrounding, then if there is any process, that will be a spontaneous process. So we need to look into the entropy change of either the system or the surrounding. Then our job is done. So you may see that when it is winter, then automatically water is forming ice. Of course, the entropy decreases of the ice, but you have to look into the surrounding and see what is happening. So let's say you come to your room and find it is totally unclean and you clean it, neat it very nicely. You have reduced the entropy of the room, but you increase the entropy of the surrounding. So whatever process you may think of, being in the universe, you are part of a big isolated system. And whatever you are doing within this universe is a spontaneous process because nobody outside the universe is telling you to do that. So that means all the processes that are going on in the universe, they are all spontaneous and they all increase the entropy. Now, whether you call the room as a system, then everything else outside the room will increase the entropy. 
or whether you talk about you spill water entropy of the that water will increase fine no problem but let's say you you know pour it back or, or clean it back or reverse it back as to some extent you reduce that entropy at the cost of something else because nothing can be done without and you know you can at most what you can do is that at most you can maintain the entropy maintain it you cannot reduce it you can either maintain it or increase it an entropy will become maximum when the system reaches equilibrium okay so our universe is not at equilibrium because the entropy is increasing when it will reach equilibrium that time entropy will be maximum and after that no more changes will happen and that is the end of the universe now coming to uh, more realistic examples like this is taken from atkins these two pictures you drop a ball and we see every time the height decreases and then finally it will stop then you will say oh it is because of inelastic collision yes it is inelastic collision that is true but why inelastic collision why could not be an elastic collision because the force at which it is hitting the ground same force the ground should give it back but what happens is that the ground absorbs some of it the ground particle absorbs it and that energy gets dissipated in the flow particles it never happens that energy of the flow particles will come close together to this particular point and hit the ball to the hand that's why we don't see a ball spontaneously coming to hand but we see that when it gets dropped it finally stops that and that is explained here that you need this kind of thing in order to push the ball back but that doesn't happen because this energy gets randomized into the flow particles so there are some demos which i cannot show because i'm doing it from ipad uh, but i see this this uh, whether this works or not yeah this this probably will work this is just a simple example of a reverse process you can clearly if somebody shows you you will tell okay this is done by taking a video and playing it reverse it cannot happen in our world it is impossible to happen in our world now if you think otherwise please let me know okay if you think it can happen in our world but we know from our observation that it can never happen so somebody must have taken a video played it back correct so if that is so then what happens in this case somebody must have taken a video and played it backward now what happens in this case somebody must have taken a video played backwards no doubt about it right no doubt or if you know you can see also that so so nicely arranged it's not possible in reality and this is unmixing of gases unmixing imagine two different particles initially mixed and they are becoming unmixed is it possible not possible now you tell me whether this is you know a, a picture which is run backward in time or forward in time uh, if you think let's say i cannot take a poll right now but if you think it is forward in time please put your hands up so that i know how many of you think forward in time if you think it is backward in time put your hands you don't have to do it so that that way i will know that uh, it is backward in time so i see only one hand forward in time one hand please if you want to participate because without without your involvement in this the doubt cannot be clarified okay i see three raised hand okay only two so rest of you think backwards i'll ask them 
Okay. Okay, three raised hand for forward in time. Four. Okay. Five, six, seven, eight, 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 nine. Okay, very nice, very nice. Please, I'll give just two minutes and drink water in between. You have to just put your hand up to tell me that it is forward in time. Uh, okay. Okay, I see 12 raised hand, no problem. Now, put your hands down and I now want you to raise your hand if you think it is run backward in time. So I would not see the same hand, I guess. Some other hands I should see for backward in time. That means taken the video and ran backward. So that time I saw 12, 13 hands up. Now I see how many hands up, let's see. So that I will know. Because either it is forward or backward, right? So total number must be equal to the full number. Okay. Nice. So almost equal number I can see. You know, 12, 8, something like that. You can, you can put your hands down now. Now I will show the same thing. And if I take a poll for this one, forward in time or backward in time, I guess I will see again similarly same number for forward and same number for backward. So one point is clear that it is very difficult to look at these videos and tell whether it is forward in time or backward in time. The reason is that these processes are in equilibrium. Since they are in equilibrium, they don't change the entropy. And because they don't change the entropy, it is hard to tell that whether it is forward or backward. Both the videos are running backward in time. But it is not easy to tell that because it is done in such a way that does not increase the entropy of the universe. Look at George Potter's video and you will see that he has demonstrated this in many, many experiments, at least four or five different ones, by drinking coffee, by doing some arrangements and things like that. So, so once, let's say two particles are mixed together, more mixing won't change anything. So therefore, once they full, are fully mixed, whatever you do to that is not going to change the entropy and therefore you will not know whether there is a, you know, uh, uh, entropy is increasing or not. And earlier, we clearly saw the backward in time was easily understandable. So, which clearly tells us that if something is happening in our world, we know that it is happening forward in time or backward in time. We can identify them, right? And you, the reason that we can identify them is because entropy has a direction. It is the direction of the time. So with time, it increases. Therefore, if some processes decreases entropy, it is must be backward in time. Okay. So how do you know entropy is increasing? If you obviously know that the that it's a video that is run backward. If if that is done, then you will know that it is backward, uh, it is decreasing entropy. Otherwise, either it is maintaining it like this, these examples, or it is uh, maintaining the entropy or it is increasing. So every day till today from the time of Big Bang. So since entropy is increasing every day, yesterday's entropy was less than today. Day before yesterday's entropy was even less and less and less and less and less till we reach to the beginning of the universe. So this is a time arrow and with this time arrow, entropy is increasing. And this is the picture of Big Bang with time. As you can see from that, the expansion of the universe has also come with an increase in entropy. This is just a schematic diagram showing the, that 
entropy is like. And today's entropy is this much, but tomorrow it will increase. Day after tomorrow, it will increase. And it will keep on increasing till when? As I said, there are videos on that by uh, uh, the, the famous scientist called, uh, uh, I forgot the name right now, a Japanese scientist. Uh, uh, if I remember, I'll tell you. Or I have the link also. You can look at that. So at the end, at the end, uh, as I said, and uh, the entropy keeps on increasing. Uh, yeah. So I think Kaku or something, I forgot the name of the, of the scientist, but I will put the link uh, somewhere for that video. Okay. So what we understood till now, we did not understand anything yet, right? We only understood that entropy follows the time, right? And there are processes which uh, obviously, uh, you know, is not allowed because they decrease entropy. So we know that it exists. This kind of quantity exists. We have to define it though. Okay. So for that, just uh, let me do one thing. Let me go to the second part of the lecture. Means it's a continuation, of course. <sighs> but it will take some time to open it. No, I am opening it from there, right? Yeah. So, but now I will come to formal definition. So, in the second law of thermodynamics can be explained in many, many uh, different ways. There are, you know, I think at least 80, uh, 80 odd ways to, uh, there are websites where the second law of thermodynamics has been, uh, has been stated in many, many different ways. But I am going to talk to you about four or five, of, or I think roughly seven, seven different ways to state second law of thermodynamics. So let's start with the first definition. First definition is, it is impossible to construct an engine that operating in a cycle will produce no effect other than extraction of heat from the reservoir and performance of an equivalent amount of work is given by this picture. So this engine where heat is taken in and fully converted to work, that is not possible. And again, the engine has to run in a cycle. It is not one step, stepwise, again and again, if you have to, then it is not possible that full heat will get converted to water. That is the Kelvin Planck statement. But this is allowed that you take the heat, does some, do some work and give away some heat to the cold bar. So remember for the first law, I said there is nothing called free lunch. For the second law, I devise something equivalent. That second law is something where you have to tip the restaurant. So for example, when you go first time to the restaurant, you can pay for your lunch, eat lunch, come back. But if you don't tip the restaurant and go there again, uh, they might not treat you well. Okay. They might know that, okay, this person never treats. So, you know, I'm not going to serve him well. So, but if you tip that guy, then what will happen next time you go, there will be no problem. So you see, Running in a cycle. So if you go to the restaurant again and again, it is better to tip the guy. So that tip is basically the entropic contribution. Whatever lunch you have taken, that is the payment for that is the, the, the first law part. The second law part is the extra one. So the heat that is taken in from the hot, you know, hot bath is not fully converted to work because some you have to give away to the cold bath. Without that, cycle cannot be completed. So that is second law of thermodynamics. And what is relation with entropy of the universe is increasing. I will come to that later on. But this also tells once more, one more statement that since Q converting to W is not possible, which means efficiency one. Efficiency is work done by heat input. So here efficiency is one. Efficiency is one. That is also not possible. So another way to state second law of thermodynamics is that it is not possible to construct an engine that has efficiency equal to one. So already two. Now Clausius statement. Clausius statement says that it is impossible to construct a refrigerator that operating in a cycle will produce no effect other than transfer of heat from low temperature reservoir to a high temperature reservoir. That means 
you cannot take heat from high temperature and uh, low temperature and put it to the cold temperature because then you don't need any electrical power for refrigeration you will have that device which will take away heat from your room and make the you know your food and other items in the refrigerator cold you don't need any electrical power but again that is not possible that will violate second law of thermodynamics and that has same relation so one can show that this statement is equivalent to the clausius planck's clausius planck statement and in order to show the equivalence one has to construct a combined system that means one has to construct you know a system where uh, yeah uh, this is a clausius statement and the equivalence of clausius planck statement so again uh, you know what you can say is that you can you can take the kelvin planck statements to be correct but then you can combine another engine associated with that and you can show that it is making the clausius statements incorrect so if you violate kelvin planck statement it will violate clausius statement again if you violate clausius statement here it will violate kelvin planck statement so they are in a way equivalent so you got now three different ways of stating second law of thermodynamics one is that you cannot get an engine that runs in a cycle and take heat from high temperature and does work only without doing anything else you you saw also that it is not possible to run a refrigerator that will take heat from cold bath and put it to the hot bath without needing any extra work or something and the efficiency of the engine cannot be one so these are the three statements so this i am running a little faster because again you can always look into my internal lecture because it will take time to explain each of them now now i will come to the definition of entropy so this is given by this is a carnot cycle in 1824 you see uh, i think 8 years before there was a there was a pastor uh, uh, his name is robert starling he made an engine hypothetical engine that has almost same efficiency as a carnot engine this is a hypothetical engine remember and this supposed to have the or it, it has the highest efficiency possible for a given set of temperature now what it does so it is all are, all parts are reversible so first part is isothermal expansion second 2 to 3 is uh, adiabatic expansion then 3 to 4 is uh, isothermal compression and 4 to 1 is adiabatic compression these are the four steps so you go from start from one come back to one so in the whole cycle this is a cycle right in the whole cycle internal energy is not changed then what is the work done then if internal energy is not changed then you know that work done is heat input minus heat output so your heat input is coming from hot high temperature bath and heat output is going to the cold temperature so q1 minus q2 is your work and what is your efficiency q1 minus q2 divided by q1 which is 1 minus q2 by q1 where is that i am not writing any of that here i think 1 minus 1 is so it is written in a plus manner but it is actually minus because again the sign is already put in inside that so uh just a second the efficiency is q in plus q out by q in it should be so this is wrong because it should be q in so this is this is wrong okay this equation can you see my uh, yeah i think there is a lag somewhere can you see this cannot cycle Yeah, yeah. Can you see uh, uh, things? Because sometimes it's getting stuck. Yeah. Okay, I'm just trying to see. So it is one minus u in. No, again I'm again I'm making the same mistake. One minus u in u out. I give it by q in. Okay, so this is the 
efficiency of that engine. So this should be out and this should be in. Okay. So this is Q in and this is Q out. Now you see interestingly, so again one can show that that efficiency is 1 minus T2 by T1. Well, T2 is the temperature of the cold bath and T1 is the temperature of the hot bath. Now, how do you get efficiency 1? If T2 is equal to 0, then eta will become 1. Correct. Now, if eta becomes 1, you will violate second law of thermodynamics. So, which means that T2 cannot be 0. So, that is another statement of second law. That absolute reaching absolute zero is not possible because if you could reach absolute zero, you could construct a, 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 an engine that will have an efficiency one, which will violate second law of thermodynamics. So that's why you cannot reach. So that is another statement of second law of thermodynamics that you cannot reach absolute zero. So now, how how this definition of entropy came about? Because again, uh, I think it was uh, Clausius who observed that when you when you write it down, all these steps, the heat and temperature and all that, then there is a quantity that is a state function which is uh, which is Q by T. At every step, if you write Q by T, then this quantity is, and since everything is reversible here, we talk about reversible, then that uh, is a state function and that will become zero. So entropy or Q by T from here to here to here to here. You can you can see that, right? So first step is Q1 by T1 and then second step is zero. Third step is Q2 by T2 and fourth step is zero is equal to zero and, and this Q1 by Q2 will be a state function. So change in entropy for the whole cycle will become zero. So he found that this quantity could be an important quantity and that is defined by Clausius to be um, entropy. And what is this definition? Very important. Remember, d, d s equal to d q reversible by t. d s is a small amount of s, right? Small amount of change. And, and big change delta s you can get by integration. Now, one thing is very important here that many people forget this reversible term. They said, okay, it is not so important. Okay, and then you get into a trap. And I'm going to show one of the trap here. Again, it will be very nice if I can get response from you. So, so let's take, uh, let's take, uh, let's take a box here where half is filled and half is empty. And this is filled by gases. Okay, these are gases, the shaded area. Now, outside is adiabatic wall. So heat cannot escape. This is adiabatic wall, it cannot escape. Okay. Now I make a hole. At some point, I make a hole here, and the gas ex escapes and fills the whole uh, whole box. Now, in this process, what is the dq? Is it zero or is it okay? So there are two things: zero or not zero. So I want to ask you: how many of you think dq zero here? Please raise your hand. Because without uh, our interaction, it is not fun. <laughs> and it cannot be explained also so well. So if you think dq is zero in this process from here to here, please raise your hand. Okay, I don't see any hand. Can you please raise your hand? Otherwise, okay. Nobody thinks dq equal to zero. Okay, that is also possible. So then, my ask, I ask another question. Then. How many of you think dq not equal to zero? Please raise your hand. How many of you think this is not zero? Okay. So so many many people think that it is non-zero. Many people think this is correct. Dq not zero. Okay, but dq not zero, but where is the heat coming from? You know, this is an adiabatic wall and this is a free expansion of the gas. So free expansion, you know, dw equal to zero. du is equal to zero because it's, a, it's, a, it's an isolated wall. 
So if du equal to zero, sorry. If du equal to zero, dw equal to zero, then dq must be equal to zero, right? Because otherwise, you know, first law will be violated. So, can anybody tell me why do you think that dq not zero here? Then I will understand that. Okay, no problem. Now, how many of you think from here to here, delta s greater than zero? How many, and delta s equal to zero? Now, how many of you think delta is greater than zero? Please raise your hand. Okay, delta is greater than zero. Some people are raising hand. No problem. Very nice. Okay, now you can bring down the hand and now tell me, you raise your hand if you think delta is equal to zero. Then please raise your hand. That means no change in entropy is happening. Okay. No, okay, everybody thinks delta is. So everybody thinks delta is greater than zero and therefore probably they think that dq not equal to zero but i already told you that dq equal to zero because dq has to be zero there is no it is an adiabatic wall it's an adiabatic wall there is no change of q now my question is that i am telling you that dq equal to zero this is correct and ds greater than zero that is also correct but then i i have a problem because dq equal to zero and uh, d is greater than zero. Anybody wants to, uh, you know, talk to me about this problem because this is my interview question. This is what I asked in the interview. I start with this diagram and I ask this question. And and thing is, there is no nothing right or wrong. You can argue whichever way you want to. So if you can convince me that dq not equal to zero, then I will be happy. So can you, whoever thinks dq not equal to zero, can you please convince me that it is not zero? And why it is not zero? Because unless you tell me, I won't know. I may be missing something, right? I may be not getting the whole picture. So can any of you tell me, whoever thought that dq not zero, can you tell me why you thought so? Come on guys, it is very important. In the class, I will actually can look at your face and kind of, you know, ask directly. But here it is not possible. So therefore, I have to depend on you. So Anjali, you are there. Normally, I can't. Yes. 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 So Anjali, you Anjali. tell me that whether uh, is it zero or non-zero in this process. If there is no nothing right or wrong, Anjali. Either it is zero or it is non-zero, right? And if it is non-zero, then why it is non-zero? You can make a coin toss and decide, no problem. But at least you will tell something, either way. But if you have no, uh, you know, again, uh, if you don't want to, then it is fine. Then I will have to ask somebody else. Okay. Uh, whom should I ask? Alagnanda, are you there? Aisharia? All starting with A. Okay. Mm, who else? Who else? Darshana? Okay. <laughs> Okay, so guys, if you don't uh, answer the question, then you know uh, your your uh, this thing uh, concept will not be clear. Okay, so remember, this is where this is the uh, this is a very important point that you need to understand to uh, understand entropy. Yes, entropy is increasing here, but dQ is zero. DQ is zero because this is an irreversible process. 
it is not a reversible process when you make a hole and gases leaks to the and fills the hole volume that is not a reversible process so dq reversible is not zero so dq is zero but dq reversible is not equal to zero but dq reversible i cannot even calculate from this process because this is an irreversible process i cannot even calculate dq reversible i can see that entropy is increasing but i can also see my dq is zero so in order to calculate the entropy i need a reversible path connecting this state 1 to state 2 i need a reversible path and this is the diagram for that reversible path that it will change slowly from here 1 to 2 and in this process dq reversible is not equal to zero it is not possible otherwise and therefore ds which is dq reversible by t is not equal to zero so entropy increase is correct but you need to consider only dq reversible and that is why dq reversible is so important not just dq that is what my main point was so in order to understand that entropy is increasing you need to focus on dq reversible part now imagine that i have two systems uh, a and b i think i have not have any picture let me just uh, clear it so i can draw something more here change the color also uh red color is fine now i'll go to blackboard yeah so yeah blackboard i'll go so then i'll use this one okay so what i was saying is that um, i was saying that uh so i have two systems let's say uh um, this is this is uh, a system a and this is system b so the temperature of the system is ta come on it's not coming yeah temperature of the system is tb and a small amount of heat dq is going from a to b okay so in this situation so what will be the change in entropy so change in entropy for a will be Minus dQ by dA, and change in the B will be plus dQ because it's getting the heat by dB. So total change, or or I I you said just uh, dS, and dS is dSA. I can think of that as B also. So what is happening here is. Uh, minus dQ by dA plus dQ by dB. Again, they are reversible, right? Because it is it's a very small amount of change, so it is reversible, reversible, reversible. See, I also make mistake in writing this reversible thing. So dQ reversible, I take common. I get one by dB minus one by dA. Now dQ reversible is a positive quantity. This is a positive quantity. Now you see. that if ta is greater than tb then this quantity will be positive and therefore ds will be greater than zero so what we uh, started with that heat is going from a to b heat is going from a to b so now if ta temperature of A is greater than temperature of B. Then only T S is greater than zero. Now Clausius has already told me that heat can go from high temperature to low temperature, and that will increase the entropy of the overall system. Now, if you take this as system, this is surrounding, and if you take this as system, then this is surrounding. So overall, this is our universe. so if clausius statement is right then 
entropy of the universe is always increasing. So you see, I now connect another statement of second law that is entropy of the system plus surrounding always increases. Okay? So with that, I will go back because if I go back, it will be wiped out. Okay? So, so now various uh, things of second law I have discussed. Uh, I don't know whether I have a summary or not. Yes, I have summary, I think. Heat cannot transfer from low temperature to high temperature spontaneously. In a cyclic process, the heat cannot be converted to work. Efficiency of the engine cannot be 1. 1 cannot reach t equal to 0. End of the universe is always in terms. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 different statements of second law we discussed. And here, I am going to take a pause because tomorrow, I am going to talk about the statistical formulation of second law because whatever I told today up to today was the um, classical description of second law. So we have seen that entropy of the universe always increases and that will be a spontaneous process. That's what Clausius said. That comes from our observation. That's what Kelvin Planck's statement said. That's what uh, we see in engines and everything. But we still did not answer this question that why entropy increases favorable. So classical description of second law cannot answer that question. And you only, you need a statistical formulation of second law given by Boltzmann to answer that question. And tomorrow I will uh, tell you after this things that, uh, that I know it's, it's a little bit far away, I'll tell you that the, the entropy that we, you know, that, yes, so, you know, by kind of, uh, yes, so, uh, uh, what do I say, uh, we always uh, can get confused about is basically nothing but options, more number of choices. If you, if the system has more choices, it has more entropy. That's it. That's what I'm going to uh, emphasize tomorrow uh, uh, and we'll uh, try to connect whatever we see from classical description that gets reflected also in the statistical description. So with that, I will uh, stop here almost two hours uh, going to be and uh, and uh, I will, you know, uh, one if you have, I will like if you have any, any question on that. Because already the material that I have covered is kind of huge. So uh, if you have any question, please let me know. And uh, we'll proceed uh, from this point onwards. And whatever I can cover in my third lecture, I will try to do that. Many things I won't be able to do that, of course. Uh, but I wanted to put more stress on the conceptual part. Because if you open a book, you can always get all the derivations, all the uh, definitions, all the formula everywhere. So I wanted to bring in something that you normally don't see. So or normally do not put, you know, do not, uh, it's not stressed enough. Uh, that's why I wanted to stress upon those points. I can tell you always go and read Atkins. You know, that should be enough. Because Atkins, you know, very nicely did physical chemistry. But there are things which uh, evade our attention. There are things which we do not think deeply. So my point was to draw your attention to those things so that uh, so that you are aware of that and you ask questions to yourself. And once you do that, your understanding becomes clear. Okay, so I think with that I will stop here and I'll uh, leave this road to Jam. Students, if you have any question, you can ask make use of some time and again they can also uh, ask by email like last time also no problem i will address them i hope that some of the questions i already addressed uh, today and if not if that is still not clear uh, definitely i can address it again tomorrow
सर जब सॉलिड इज फॉर्म the amount of energy that is uh, that has been released when the molecule combined will be maximum right will be maximum yeah compared to what compared so they to only what? say uh, maximum yeah. has to be with respect to something sir so, means i was thinking about what uh, what is letting yeah. to some compound to be solid means uh, the bond will be the maximum uh, sorry bond strength will be the maximum So the amount of energy released will be the maximum, right? Yeah, compared to the state of the form liquid, right? right? When you say maximum, then it is with respect to something, right? So compared to that, it will be more. That is true. It's a relative thing. Maximum is a relative thing, right? So with respect to something, it will be more or not. I'm I'm getting an echo, so I'll just try to stop the my other 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 uh, uh, meet Google Meet thing. Yeah, I think I'm already out of time. Uh, yeah, so so do you understand? So basically, I I I get your question. So your question is that instead of liquid, if it forms a solid, whether release will be more or not, I would say probably yes. but not always uh, depending on situations whether there are other components associated with that or not those things will also uh, play a role uh, you know sometimes you know you know certain certain solids directly sublimes it does it doesn't even form liquid so for them you know if you form liquid probably you know it will be more difficult to do so right so those are the things one has to observe but you can say one thing that state a and state b what is the energy difference and that energy difference will be released okay sir thank you okay sir uh, sir in the equilibrium process examples uh, you gave an example of a person swinging so mm -hmm. uh, if a person jumps on a trampoline that can also be considered an equilibrium process yeah that's a good point It's if every time process. you jump to the same extent every time there will be should not be any change uh, yes sir if we somehow do yeah somehow manage to keep the height same all the time and then if you take a movie and play it background and if your friends cannot tell whether the movie is running forward and backward then you must know that you are maintaining the entropy so okay. that is the test whether you are following it in an equilibrium way or not Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, in the ex uh, example of the gas expanding in a container, uh, how can we visualize the uh, entropy? Like, uh, is there more surface area for a yes, gas yes. to? Yes. So I I will tell that in more detail tomorrow. So what is happening is that for every particle, earlier they were occupying let's say volume V, now they are occupying volume two V. so imagine that that volume v has the small small you know sub volumes or you can say small small uh, you know compartments you break that whole volume into small small compartments those compartments are as small as the size of the particle only okay then yes. if you if you have v where the particle can go but if you make the volume 2v then you will have two n compartments where the particles can go yes so now the particle has more choices to go okay right and that's why the entropy will increase so that's why i'm saying that this in order to understand that you need to uh, uh, go into statistical description of the second law classically also you can understand because when it is expanding it will require the heat to go in it has to maintain the everything same and therefore yes. the entropy will increase okay okay because okay. otherwise an expansion process what will happen it will cool down so in order to maintain the temperature heat must go in and since heat is going in but not for the process that i talked about not for the free expansion for the uh, reversible process because for the mm. free expansion dq is zero because that is not even reversible 
okay okay so that's why it is very important to put that reversible sign in the formula of entropy otherwise it will not be correct and this was a, one of the example to show you why it is not correct to put dq by t okay sir because dq by t is zero but entropy is not zero yes okay okay sir okay any other question uh, guys don't sorry. hesitate to ask questions okay it is not nobody is going to think that you are not uh, good for asking the question rather it is opposite you have the courage to ask the question to so take it that way sir? yeah who is present uh, sir uh, i am nandu sir yeah nandu Hello. tell me Uh, sir, uh, does uh, second law of thermodynamics allow complete uh, conversion of work into heat? Second law of thermodynamics is uh, work uh, into heat. Okay. Is is a complete conversion is possible? No. Uh, what? Okay. Work into heat also not possible. Heat into work is okay. just just like that not possible. Work into heat also not possible. Uh, it is the same reason of second law. Same same reason of second law because otherwise again the efficiency will be one. Ah okay. Because see, every as I told you, every process that you are doing, you have to give some kind of a penalty for entropy. If if it is not done in an equilibrium way, if if the equilibrium is not maintained, it will increase the entropy. Okay, thank you. Sir. Okay. Sir. Yes. Sir, why is it said that in physics, work done by the system is positive? Why uh -huh. in chemistry work done by the system is negative? Why yeah. there is such an analogy? It's a convention only. See, it's a convention only. It is not, uh, you know. Uh, uh, so basically, you know, if you want to talk about efficiency of a machine, then you need to see that what is the work done by the system, right? Because machine is doing the work. Okay. So, so that is the convention. And in chemistry, people talk about, uh, you know, piston on a gas. So therefore, when you compress the gas. you are doing work on the system and that is in increasing the internal energy so th th so it is a convention it is always minus pdv that is work done on the system of course ha huh, work done on so it is just a convention nothing else whichever way you do you are going to get the same result and but the why okay, the convention sir. started that i have no idea uh, but uh, that's what i guess that it is because of uh, to check the efficiency of the machine one has to see work done by the system Okay. Sir, why in irreversible process we consider d q equal to zero, while in a reversible process we say that it's not equal to zero? Ah, okay. Uh, for the expansion example, right? Ah, yes, sir. So for the first thing, I it was an adiabatic wall, right? So there is no heat going in or going out. So d q equal to zero. And it is not a reversible process, so DQ irreversible is equal to zero. Correct? No, I, I'm asking whether it's always in the case of irreversible process DQ. No, 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 zero. no, 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 no. This was one of the example to you know constructed in such a way. No, it is not true that all irreversible processes will have DQ equal to zero. No, that is not true. That is not true. See, simple. You know, when you heat something, let's say you take a rod and heat it. that is an irreversible process because you are not maintaining you know very very slow heating and that uh, is not dq not equal to zero in fact in that expansion process if you did not keep adiabatic wall then also dq will not be equal to zero okay sipa hi yes, sir clear okay. thank you sir Ah, uh, sir. Like for as you said right now, for the uh, irreversible change, dQ is equal to zero in some cases. So, if you could uh, please give some common example for it. Ah, uh, for dQ equal to zero or not equal to zero? dQ equal to zero. So equal to zero is exactly that I explained, right? So you take a in a in insulated wall and all that, and poke a hole in between, and it will expand. uh the gases will expand and that will be dq not equal to zero dq not equal to zero means heat cannot go out or go in okay so so in that situation dq will not be equal to zero 
sorry, the Q will be equal to zero in that situation where you do not allow the heat exchange from the surrounding. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. So, if you want, you can think of let's say uh, an insulated uh, insulated chamber where gases is there. You connect that to another insulated chamber, and then uh, you know there is a pin in between which you plug plug it out, and the gases will diffuse to the other side. That will be a process where dq will be not equal to zero, uh, equal to zero, but entropy will increase. Sir, so, uh, you said that the for the universe entropy will increase, right? All the time. So, ah, uh, uh, all the time. So, uh, will it increase continuously or uh, will it stop in a certain limit or anything like that? So, so the thing is, about, so you understood why the entropy is increasing because uh, entropy increases only when you uh, you do some uh, you know process, like let's say when you move, when we talk. when something changes any change that is happening in our universe because our universe is an isolated system and changes are happening within this system it means that entropy will increase because entropy uh, for a spontaneous process will increase for an isolated system our universe is an isolated system we are part of the universe therefore any process that happens anything at all if it happens in a non equilibrium way will increase the entropy now you tell me when it will not increase when nothing is changing wherever absolutely are, and wherever things are the stars are not you know blinking and then planets are not moving you know nothing is happening anywhere the wind is not blowing so nothing has to happen in order for entropy not to increase you understand so so, it was, so in the process so uh, any two process can cancel out the increase in entropy right no no that is the thing no. one process increases no, so that means you are saying that one process will increase another process will decrease the entropy right but decrease in some cases it... no in decrease of entropy is not allowed you understand it is not okay. allowed so therefore nothing okay. will decrease it yes if it could i would agree with you that it will cancel but there is no process that you can think of by the way i will tell that in a in a microscopic manner there will be some processes which can decrease but on an average on an average let's say you take an average of a second or or millisecond on that average entropy will increase so even if it instantaneously decreases but it will make it up for that decrease and it will increase even more you understand my point so let's say the air yes, sir. the room for for a for a fraction of a nanosecond or atom second came into a corner of the room or or density has changed somewhere but it will make it up immediately so that on an average if you measure you will not see any decrease okay okay sir thank you yeah clear, clear sir So I had a doubt. Yes. yes. So uh, when uh, there is any change, you said that the entropy increases. So, like for example, when a person is sitting on a swing and is moving, there is movement. So there is change. So you, how can it be like um, there is you spending energy? So how can it be a state yes, of equilibrium? Right. And then uh, you are absolutely right. You are absolutely right. So if you are thinking. the person standing from somewhere going to the swing starts the swing then entropy has increased but during the swing it is not because then during the swing there is no change and again that change again we are considering the whole process as swinging process not the process coming from this point to that point so whole swinging process entropy is not changing but before but so that, during ha huh, yes so during the swinging there is an energy spent right to maintain 
or it like in a constant speed or something you're right you're right so let's say no that is initial energy that you put before the swing right after that you are not putting when you drop a ball for example there is an elastic collision once you drop the ball once it hits the floor if let's say there is no loss in entropy or no loss in energy it will come to your hand right and that will continuously go on forever if it is an elastic collision you are not spending every time energy you have spent once and that is maintaining so in swing what happens you have the potential energy because swing you pull it up to a certain height and then you release it and then it goes down just like a pendulum so your initial potential energy is getting converted to kinetic energy and back to potential energy isn't it yes sir so in that case you are not putting in any energy and therefore there will be no change in entropy at that point Okay, so but then it will come to a constant later, right? Like it will. Exactly. Change. No, no. That you are right. In realistically, it is. In, it will change the entropy. Realistically, but what I am saying that if that a process happens, let's say without any friction, without any anything, no um, uh, no loss in energy with anything, then of course it is uh, not going to increase. But you are right that for realistic cases, it is going. To. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so nice question, guys. So you know, keep it up. Ask questions. Clarify your doubt. If you understand everything, no need to ask. But if you you know I, I like to ask, then don't hesitate. That is the point. Sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, are all spontaneous process irreversible? Which process, sir? All in uh, are all spontaneous yeah. process can be considered irreversible. Right, more or less, more or less. There is no perfect reversible process. One can only construct a quasi-static process if it is done very very slowly. But otherwise, they are all kind of irreversible. Sir, uh, can quasi-static process can be spontaneous? Yes, a uh, quasi-static process is almost yes. like a reversible process that can be constructed. Yes. It, it can be made spontaneous. Okay, spontaneous? Ah, uh, no, probably not. Quasi-static process. Spontaneous processes may not be quasi-static, unless let's say you make it such a way. So, for example, our glass. Ah, uh, you know, uh -huh. the, the sand is dripping. You know, little by little. It can be so uh -huh. slow, or or there is a there is a pitch experiment which is happening for hundred years. the peach is dropping or something like that okay flowing it is so slow that is almost uh, quasi static if that can be you know possible in some some situations it is continuous a glacier for example comes very very slowly movement is very slow so that kind of thing can be thought as a quasi static in my opinion although i am not 100% sure about that but that is my own. that would be my opinion Uh, so, uh, sir, in some textbooks, the terms spontaneity and irreversibility are used synonymously. So that's why I. Yeah, I yeah. So, both of the spontaneous uh, processes are irreversible, but again, in some cases, can be constructed. Okay, okay, sir. Thank you. Sir. Hello, sir. Yeah. So, in the free expansion under the adiabatic conditions, uh, uh, yeah, we are considering cooling in the case of real gas only. Ideal gas uh, will not have any change in internal energy or in work done. Correct. I ideal gas will not uh, not have change in uh, because this expansion the dQ is zero, dU is zero because there is uh, no change in temperature and therefore, uh, you know everything is zero. Right. Okay, sir. So we considered the example regarding the real gas. The the example that I talked about for that yes. is for anything real or ideal, because oh. he, I only said that dQ, but I did not say dU is not changing. dU may be changing because of the oh. real gas. For ideal gas, the dU will not change, but for real gas, dU will change. And the entropy will uh will oh, okay. yeah entropy will also change, but that entropy changes. Happening because of the expansion of expansion. volume expansion, as I mentioned. And in order to understand that or, or calculate the entropy change, you have to construct 
an equivalent reversible path. For example, if you are going from one to two, okay, in an irreversible yes. manner, you will not be able to calculate the entropy because entropy cannot be calculated for irreversible paths. So, since entropy is a state function, what you should do is that you will connect one to two with a reversible path. Okay, okay. And yes, then calculate sir. the entropy, and that will be the entropy difference between one to two. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, guys, any other question? You know, sometimes what I, I, I do in my class is that I conduct the whole class only for questions. Because uh, once you start asking, you, know, you will see that so many questions will come to your mind. If you don't ask, nothing will come. But if you start asking, slowly, slowly those questions will come. And that's why I want you guys to make that habit of asking questions. Once you have the habit, Everything is about habit. Okay, that's what I realize now. Uh, you know, for after a long time, that everything, whatever you call it, like a creative task, uh, you know, it may be a drawing, it may be writing a novel, it may be whatever painting or whatever creative thing you can think of, or asking questions or reading a book. Everything is a matter of practice. So if you practice to a certain extent, you can go. You may not be a genius in that particular thing. But you can do a, you know, be reasonably good with practice. Okay, so make a habit of asking questions. You can do these things if you are very serious about it. Is that whatever topic you are studying, ask a few questions on that topic to yourself. Those questions should not be from books or should not be from uh, the, the the exercise and all that. This should be your question. Okay, and you will see how difficult it is because. Some exercise I used to do is that I used to tell my students to make questions for other students, and that time they would realize that how difficult it is to make questions. It is easy to answer a question, but it's more difficult to make a question. You will realize that when you are supposed to take exam for others, okay, then you will understand the difficult because question need not be very tough. It need not be very easy. It has to follow the syllabus, although it should not be obvious. All those things. Will actually make it do a good question, okay? And good question will lead to a better understanding. Okay, I guess uh, no more questions are there, right? Okay. Yes, I think we can wind up today's session here. Uh, we will wait for questions in the Google form. We will circulate it again, and we will we'll check it. Uh, we will communicate to you tomorrow. So let's wind up. Thank you, Professor. Tomorrow, uh, tomorrow then two thirty we are meeting again, right? Yes, yes, exactly. Two thirty we'll be starting. Yeah, that also I will communicate uh, that time change. So thank you, thank you, Professor Anup, and all the participants. Thank you. I mean, the question session last session was really interesting. Many, many, many questions are coming <laughs> after the waiting. No, it takes some time for the students to you know open up and be familiar with that. And like that. Yeah, yes, so yes. I think you are mute. Uh, Yaman, you are mute. Uh, Professor Jaman, you are new. Yeah, okay. Am I audible